everybody. Thank you for joining this professional synoptic revision session. My name is Anne and I work at First Intuition. I'm an AAT tutor. I've uh, been doing this for quite a while now. And uh, yeah, the professional synoptic is one of the units that I uh, take care of. And we are going to be having a look this evening at a task from one of the First Intuition mocks. And the task that we're going to do this evening is task six. So over the past couple of weeks, we've tried to pick up on the tasks that you have said that generally you find the most difficult and the tasks that I suppose is reinforced by the examiner's comments in terms of the ones that students do the least well with. So that's been task number two, task number two, task number four, and then tonight it's going to be task number six. So this task deals with the accounting systems and controls section of the syllabus. And it's actually two tasks in your assessment that cover this section of the unit. So you would see this within task number three as well. So it was a bit of a toss up this evening between task three and task six, but I opted here for task number six when I um, did a bit of a straw poll at the end of the first session that seemed to be the one people had the most difficulties with. So it's going to be task six this evening. And if you are an FI student already, then you can find this task in mock number two. If you're not an FI student, then just use the question download file that I up updated into the chat box a couple of minutes ago. Okay, so let's get our task open then. You should have, if you're not a first intuition student, this revision question pack downloaded now. So I'm just going to whiz through till we find task number six. That's five, so we've got to be nearly there. Just a note also, if you're not a student of first intuition, so you might not have come across this before, if this is your first time in this session, before each task, what we've done is include a little bit of a technical recap. I'm not going to be running through this now, but if you do need this and you want to sort of get involved a little bit with more with some of the task, things that a task six might cover, you want to do a bit of a technical recap, then there's a few pages there that sort of run through some key things that might be good for you to recap on. So please have a look at that at some stage if you haven't already, if you haven't seen it in our materials before. Okay, thank you for that. Somebody's just sharing their our past sessions. As we've said, they are all available on YouTube and you can also find them from that um, Google Drive link that I just included not so long ago. But thanks for doing that, much appreciated. Okay, so this is a task, task at six that we're going to be looking at. And I think this is something that I've said to you before, but I'll say it again now. When I come to a task six like this one, and I can see, read the first paragraph, it says following some issues that have been highlighted in the purchase system at Horizon Hot Tubs, you've been asked to undertake a full review of the system and have prepared the following report. I can then see that my report is in sections. So I've got a section that deals with orders, um, a section dealing with goods received, talks about purchase payments and so on. There's quite a lot of stuff to read through there. And as I'm reading it through, I'm thinking I've got no idea why I'm reading all of this. Why are they telling me all of this? What am I supposed to do with it? So what I think is probably a good idea before I read all of that is to actually read the requirements. So then when I'm reading the question, I can read it far more actively because I've got a much better idea about what I'm being asked to do. So I would always recommend where there is a big text before the requirements, read the requirements first. I know, Carly, this is the way of things now, isn't it? With all these computer based exams, we're stuck with the screens. I think we're just going further and further into that, uh, <laughs> that way of learning now. So unfortunately, I don't think we're going to go back to the old, good old printed versions. Certainly when I did my exams, we do with pen and paper, that's sort of like, don't turn over till we tell you type situation. But um, no, we're stuck with the screens now. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the requirements. Holly has asked you to complete some further work on the purchase system identify the risks it currently presents to Horizon Hot Tubs and make recommendations on how to address the issues. 
So there appears to be two things, some risks and some recommendations. So firstly, identify five, five weaknesses in Horizon Hot Tub's internal controls in respect of the purchase system. So that's why they told me all of this then, all this information about the purchase of system, because they want me to find five weaknesses with the system. And note this, explaining, that's a key verb, explaining the risk each of these represents for Horizon Hot Tubs. So there's two things to do actually here. For each weakness, I've got to do five of them. For each one, I've got to identify. So out of all the information that's being presented, I've got to find a weakness. And then I've got to explain why it's actually a problem. Explain why it's a problem. Explain why it's a risk. What could the implications be? What could go wrong as a result of this weakness that I've identified? So identify as a verb doesn't require a lot of explanation. It's just find it, write it down. But the explain, that does require more attention. And the explain wants me to really think about how that could be a problem for Horizon Hot Tubs. What could go wrong? What could this weakness lead to? What are like the worst case scenarios, I suppose, as a result of this weakness that we have identified? So make sure we identify initially, and then we want to make sure that we explain why it's going to be a problem. So I'm looking for five of those. 10 marks, worth noting that too. So let's work on two marks for each weakness. There's then a part B of the question worth five marks. So they want five improvements. So one mark each. Recommend five improvements to the internal controls, which can be made to address the weaknesses in the purchase system. So I'm gonna identify the weaknesses first in part A, and then part B I'm gonna say, what would I do to improve each one? What would I change? So I can go back to the five weaknesses that I've identified and for each one, I can recommend how I would do things differently. Okay, so now we know what we're supposed to be doing. Perhaps we can have a read through the question. And as we do that, let's see if we can find some weaknesses. So I think we can have an initial read through. We can maybe identify where we think the weaknesses are and then we can come back and write them up in our answer. So, having read all the requirements, I'm now going to start reading the question. So I'm going to start again right from the top. So following some issues that have been highlighted in the purchasing system, we've been asked to undertake a full review and have prepared the following report. So let's just read that first paragraph and you can tell me if you spot any weaknesses in that first paragraph perhaps. So the warehouse managers require consumables like hot tub chemicals, filters, they complete a requisition form. That all seems quite straightforward. This is submitted to the purchasing team. That also seems quite normal. The requisition form forms do not require authorization and no reference is made to the current inventory levels of the consumables being requested. There's our problem, isn't it? There is the problem, there is the weakness. Absolutely right. So the requisition forms do not require authorization. So I think that's a weakness there. No reference is made to the inventory levels of the consumables requested. That's a problem too. So we've got a couple of weaknesses already in that first paragraph. We could treat that as two, we could treat it as one, it does seem to be in the same sort of area, so we might just treat that as one weakness, but that is definitely a problem there. But I want to make sure that I, when I write it up, that I mention both those issues. Excellent. So we're just identifying them for now, we're going to write them up in a moment, but let's have that as number one. The staff in the purchasing team use the requisition form to raise sequentially numbered purchase orders based on the approved supplier list. We like sequentially numbered orders. Anything that's sequentially numbered is good because then it shows me if there's a gap, if there's a problem, something missing. Um, they place their orders based on an approved supplier list. So rather than just picking anybody, we've picked out the suppliers. That's a good thing too. This list was updated 12 months ago. 
and then since that horizon have started selling to the Republic of Ireland. That's the problem, isn't it? As you're telling me, the supplier list is out of date. It was updated 12 months ago. Maybe there's better deals on offer, better value for money, better quality, better prices. Maybe there's even more local suppliers if we're now dealing with the Republic of Ireland as well, is there anybody more local that we could use rather than having to send everything across the seas? How often should we update them, Laura? That's a very good question. And I think it depends on our industry to some degree. So I would say perhaps at least every six months, maybe, or even three months, perhaps depending how volatile prices are depending how often new companies enter the market. So how often we have sort of a choice of a new supplier. So yeah, very much industry specific with definitely more, definitely more um, recently, I think it says um, than, than 12 months up. That to me is a hint that there's something wrong there. Okay, let's read on. Purchasing manager, Binny, authorizes the purchase orders. That's good, we need them to be authorized prior to them being sent to the relevant supplier. When the goods are received, the warehouse manager will verify the quantity received to the supplier's dispatch note. That's usually what a warehouse manager would do. So as the goods are received, the warehouse manager looks at the quantity on the piece of paper to say, you're saying you've said 10 of them, I'm counting 10 of them, okay, that's good. So I'm checking at the quantity that's been received. They also check the quality. Excellent. So they're not just saying we've received 10. We're also saying we've received 10 of the correct quality. They then record all that on a goods receive note, which is an internal document created by the warehouse manager to say we received 10 of these items and I'm going to add them to our inventory. Yes, Josh, I actually think it should. I think the goods received need to be checked against the purchase order to check what's being received is actually what we ordered. So I think there is a gap there. And I think with this sort of question, really important that we read what's there. And I don't find a problem with anything that's been said there. Nothing in that paragraph looked wrong. Perhaps where, what, where there was something wrong was that there was something missing, that a stage perhaps hadn't been included. So it definitely needs to be checked back to the purchase order. We might have received 10. Those 10 might be in excellent condition. But if we didn't order 10, we only ordered one, then there's still a problem, isn't there? So there's no suggestion that as the goods are arriving, that we're actually checking them to a purchase order. That does need to happen somewhere. Yep. So that's a really important step. Good. Next one, goods received. Um, individual warehouses complete a sequentially numbered goods received note. We said we like the sequential numbering. So as the goods are received, we make a note of them. A copy of this is sent to Maisie Fox, the general accounts clerk. The other copy is kept in the warehouse. That looks okay as well. We do need a copy to go to accounts because they need to know that the things have been received before they pay for them. A copy can stay in the warehouse. We have no problem with that. The purchase invoices, these come from the supplier, of course, are sent directly to Maisie. She stores them in a manual file until the end of the week. They're then input into the purchase ledger using a batch control and each invoice is given a unique number based on the supplier code. Can anybody see any issues there? Yes, Katie, that's another point you could raise. Yep. Good. Yes. This manual file where they're stored until the end of the week, I think this is another weakness. I think as somebody suggested, the chat box goes a little bit fast here, but uh, yeah, they could definitely be lost, couldn't they, within a week? Just being stored in some filing tray somewhere, there is a possibility that they go could go missing before they get entered into the computer. So I do have a bit of an issue with them just being stored in a manual file. So I think we've definitely got a weakness there. Paperwork could go missing. Yep, no physical protection on the file. 
because they are just a piece of paper on a desk. Yes, we should perhaps import them daily if we're thinking through to our improvement. Absolutely agree with that. Yes, and could there then be a delay of raising a query with the supplier if there is a query? Yes, absolutely, because they're just sitting in the tray for a week before anybody looks at them. So that would certainly delay raising any problems if there was a problem, if we thought we'd be charged the wrong prices, for example. So that would delay everything. Excellent. Next. Purchase, uh, purchase invoices are reviewed and authorised for payment by the finance director. The actual payment is made 70 days later. Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? Or could be a problem. I see a potential weakness there. The fact that this payment is only made 70 days after the invoice goes into the system. Perhaps it should be made in accordance with the supplier's terms. If 70 days are the supplier's terms, it's not a problem, but I think we can certainly raise this as an issue. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. So we've got 70 days plus the seven it sits in the filing tray. So it's sort of a maximum of 77. You're quite right. Yeah, there's a point there. Another suggestion about segregation of duties. Oh, there's some more people in my chat box. Um, in my waiting room, let's let them in. Segregation of duties, no segregation, absolutely. Reviewing the purchase invoice and approving it for payment. So reviewed and authorised by one person. Yep, there could be a segregation of duties there, certainly. So I want you want, well, <laughs> what I also want you to see here is that there are lots of points. We're actually asked for five. You might see more than five here. And that's OK. So then you just pick the five that you think are perhaps the biggest issue. But you might have a segregation of duties issue there, certainly. Now, the other thing, and I don't know if somebody did mention this in the chat box because it does go quite quickly. Um, is that I see here, if we just think about what happens here, that we have the goods received note. Here. And we said the goods receive note is then obviously an input onto the system. We said that Maisie puts the purchase invoices into the system. But again, as we've said, there seems to be no linking. So where's the linking between what was received? What did we actually order? And then what about the invoice? Is the invoice checked to the purchase order? We said that the goods received note must be checked to the purchase order. Are we checking the invoice to the purchase order? Are we paying for what we actually ordered? Are we paying for what was delivered? There's no suggestion that that link is going on here. Oops. So I think we've got an issue here in terms of checking what we ordered to the invoice. I want to make sure we check our goods received note to the purchase order, fair enough. I then want to check that the order matches the invoice and I'm actually paying for the goods that I ordered. Rebecca, you're asking what do they mean by a batch control? Well, the way that a batch control would generally work is if you've got like basically a pile of invoices on your desk, you would add them all up and let's say those invoices total £7,100. You then input all the invoices and at the end when you've input them all, you want to check that the total of the invoices you, that you've input equals £7,100. So that way you're checking the total of the batch that the invoices in total equal the amount that you've entered into the computer. So it does look like the invoices are just inputting batches. That could be a problem, as you're suggesting here. So yeah, I can see a problem there too. So this, but we might come up with another suggestion instead of the batch controls. Maybe we should have individual sequential numbering of the invoices rather than just entering something in one big batch. Yes, absolutely, Rebecca, I agree with that. Yes. 
So there's weaknesses all over the place, isn't it? I started numbering them, I've lost track of my numbers now, but we've got little weaknesses all over the place. So what I wanted to show you by sort of reading through this before we start writing it up is that there are all, all sorts of things that you could include. We won't include them all now because we, we want five, but we could certainly have a whole range to choose from. And the key is as you do write them up, that you identify the weakness. So that's just finding it, which is what we've been doing here. And then you explain it and say, this is why it could be a risk. So let's make a start then in terms of writing some of these up. We're going to use maybe some bullet point abbreviations just for timing. But let's see what we can come up with. If I go back to the very beginning, the first issue seemed to be that the requisition forms were not authorised. So that was an issue and nobody checked inventory levels either. So let's include that as a weakness. So remember, this is just a bullet pointed answer. If you wanted a slightly fuller answer, then there are some solutions available to you on that Google document together with this question pack. You've also got the suggested um, answers. So I'm just going to bullet point some ideas here. So the requisition form is not authorised and the inventory is not checked in advance. Inventory is not checked before the order is made or before the requisition is made rather. Okay, so that's the, I would say generally, the easier part because identify as a verb requires less from us. The next part is to explain the risk. Why is that a problem? Well, the fact the requisition form is not authorised is going to be a problem then, isn't it? Because it increases the risk of fraud, as you say, misappropriation. Yeah, very good. So I'm now going to do my explaining. And I'm not necessarily in the exam going to write the word explain, but I want to demonstrate to you that it's really important that you do these two parts. So we did the identify and we said, there you go. And the identify is often paraphrasing the question. And just picking up the point that's been mentioned and you're saying that's the point I'm picking, the explain is where we do something extra. So under the explanation, we have the risk of fraudulent purchases because of course they're not being authorised, so presumably people can just buy what they want, sell them on through eBay, <laughs> whatever they might be doing. So risk of fraudulent purchases, and then the inventory hasn't been checked either. So there is a risk of overordering, which might result in holding too much inventory. Which is not good for our cash flow or working capital, and then if it's held too long can become obsolete, and it's just not the best use of our money. So you've got all of that to think about. Yes, all the money held in inventory mini. Yes, lovely. Excellent, brilliant ideas there through the chat box, well done. Somebody asked me, could this be two separate weaknesses? And the answer is, I think, yes, it could. And I do think in terms of this particular question, because there's so many different weaknesses to choose from, um, I didn't feel that I needed to split that into two. I could have split it into two if I would have wanted. It was in the same paragraph in the question. It was on the same area. So I treated it as one. But if you were struggling to find weaknesses, then absolutely, I think you could actually split that into two. Sorry, I've just got somebody else popped up in the waiting room. There we go. Uh, Laura, can you write the risk? Uh, can you write the weakness and then the risk on the next line to make it easier for the examiner clearer to read? Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely do that. I would use some paragraphs if you like. Of course, we've got a separate section of the question where it's going to ask us about what we're going to do about these things. But I would definitely separate, as I did there, 
here's my identify bit, this is my weakness, and then this is my explanation. So I would make it very clear, perhaps by leaving a clear line in between, that I've got my risk and then I've got my explanation of that. Yes. So Oliver's saying the goods might have an expiry date. So of course, if we order too many, then they just sit in inventory and they eventually become obsolete. Absolutely right. Yeah. Just checking through the chat box, everything that you've said there, some really good points. All the money tied up in inventory, purchasing too much stock, stock isn't liquid, it affects our ratios, current ratio, certainly. Yes, absolutely right. Extra storage costs, extra insurance. Yes. Now, Eleanor's suggesting, and there's no problem with doing it this way either, and we can certainly do it this way now while we're actually, uh, while we're here, that once we've done this weakness, is it a good idea maybe to do the suggested improvement? Because we've just put all this effort into thinking through the weakness. So while we're here, why don't we just suggest the improvement for it as well? Then we can go back and find our next weakness. So why not? So what is our improvement for this then? How would we do things differently? So having highlighted all the problems what is your suggestion to make it right think about what the <laughs> the uh, the problem was that things weren't authorized so we have to get an authorization absolutely right so the requisition forms need to be authorized And the inventory needs to be checked. Before sending to the purchasing team. Yes, absolutely right. And perhaps depending on the amount of the requisition, you might even have more than one signature needed if the requisitions are for larger amounts. We could add that as a little bit of a bonus point, if you like. So we might even consider two signatures. Where the requisition is over a certain amount of money. If anybody has that at work, perhaps you have to have multiple signatures for larger, larger items. So I think there's a couple of things that we're suggesting that we have to have an authorization signature and we need to be checking the inventory as well before we actually put this through. Excellent. <laughs> so I think that deals with um, one of the weaknesses we've got five to find. So I think that's a, a really good one to kick us off. Let's see what else there is. We did highlight quite a few, didn't we? So we don't necessarily need them all, but let's see. What have I labelled number two? Oh, that was about the list being updated, wasn't it? So we're going to identify first, and then we are going to talk about why it's a problem. So again, in the exam, I wouldn't use the word identify, but I just want to make it clear for you. That's what we're doing. Again, just bullet points, you'd have to have this in better sentences in your exam. So the approved supplier list not updated for over 12 months. And certainly since they started to sell to Ireland, so that's the problem. What, why is it a problem? What is the risk? What is the problem? Then, yes, I think I wrote, certainly wrote enough in terms of weakness one. Um, but remember, I only did bullet points. You'd have to have yours in full sentences, but the amount of points I raised was enough. You just need to form it into proper sentences. So the risk here then, yeah, really good. 
the, recent, uh, the sheet hasn't been updated recently, so you're saying we might be missing out on discounts, it might be costing us more, poorer quality, absolutely. So let's say that the suppliers on the list may not be the best suppliers anymore. And that could be in terms of price, it could be in terms of quality, it could be in terms of location. So the risk is that we are paying too much or not getting high quality goods. checking the chat box here yes so there's lots of things that you can think about here in terms of ethics and sustainability you might say that there are other suppliers that share horizon hot tubs ethos on sustainability more maybe working with more ethical products you could be looking for sustainable suppliers so you can definitely include that as a point suppliers may not share the horizon hot tub sustainable values remember a whole year has passed um talking about exchange rates well i think at the moment we weren't supplying to ireland when the list was first created we are now supplying to ireland so there will be exchange rate differences of course so if we're making sales in ireland it would make sense to actually have supplies in ireland as well so because of exchange rates, that would be another risk. So the risk is actually not having the sale and the purchase in the same currency. So we make the sale to Ireland, it would be reduce our risk if we actually made our purchase in Ireland as well. And there could be cheaper supplies in Ireland, we could certainly save on the travel costs, couldn't we? Shipping costs, because if we had a local supplier, that would definitely be reduced. Yes, so some excellent ideas there. So they are our weaknesses. We now need to come up with an improvement. So in terms of improvement, I think we know what we're going to say there. We need to review and update this list more regularly. Let's consider a review, and I don't think there is a definitive right or wrong here, but let's say we'll consider a review every three to six months. Or let's say every three months, let's make it quarterly. Yep, we should negotiate discounts. So we should review quantities, I would say, and negotiate discounts where we can. So if we find that we're buying more, then we ought to be getting better prices. That's something we should certainly consider. We should also consider suppliers. in the country of sale, which would mitigate those exchange rate risks. So if we start selling to a new country, let's try to find a supplier in that new country as well. Yeah, lower carbon footprint, absolutely, which would be better for our sustainability, wouldn't it? Yes. So not only is that a benefit in terms of exchange rates, it's also a benefit in terms of carbon footprint. 
So we're saying this is our improvement and this is why it's an improvement. This is how we're going to be better off. Um, I'm not sure, Jonathan. I don't think so. Not with this one. Because we're talking about the improvements and I think for the improvement, I've got to basically say this is my improvement. And I also want to say this is why it's an improvement. So I don't only want to give the improvement. I want to explain why I think it would make things better. So I do feel here that um, I've, I've been able to do that with a few ideas. I'm not suggesting that you have to have all these ideas in your question. I think you could certainly get away with less. But um, if I was the marker, I think certainly here, if it says that I want you want five weaknesses, then I wouldn't expect you to be included more than five. And I think my improvement, I am addressing the exact problem that I identified. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I have included here more than I would in the assessment. The thing I've got to be mindful of is, of course, this is just five marks. So it's one mark for each. So in the time that you have to formulate the answer, I don't think you could say all of this. There's certainly not going to be time to write as much as we've put here. But you could pick on any of those points. I think definitely include what your improvement is and then explain why it's going to make things better. Okay. Let's move then on to weakness number three. What have we got? Um, it looks like the goods received notes are not checked to the purchase order. So I can mention that one. So we know the goods received notes are actually checked. They are checked for quality and quantity. But if we don't check to the purchase order, we don't know whether what's actually been delivered is what we ordered. Well, what the examiner says about why people struggle with this task is that they are too general and don't use the information from the scenario enough. So people don't dig into the scenario and come up with the points. But you can have a look at the examiner's report. I think that would be that's always a really great thing to have a look at. And of course, this is just one example of a, a task six. There's many more. There might be more challenging questions than this one, perhaps. This is just the one in the mock that we chose for today. Yes, you can certainly use the word reconciled here. So the goods, I said the goods received are not checked to the purchase order. You can say they're not reconciled to the purchase order. That's absolutely fine. That's a great word to use as well. So we've said the weakness is, it's that it's possible that the incorrect goods are received. So ultimately, Horizon will end up pay, paying for that were not requested. And that has an impact on cash levels, it has an impact on inventory, all of that. So, really important that what's received is actually what we ordered. I don't think you really do need the pre-release in this question, Alice. Um, you might need the pre-release in some questions. Some, This one particularly, when it's talking about strengths and weaknesses, it does give you a lot of extra information. So I probably wouldn't be referring to the pre-release much in this one at all. 
And Thomas, the answer to that question, it depends on the actual exam that you're sitting. I can't actually give a definitive answer to that. Generally, a lot of students come out and say that they don't feel they need to refer to the pre-release much at all. Um, and the point of the pre-release is just to give you a context for the company that you're dealing with, what its values are, what its key successes are, how it's got to be where it is now. And just to give you a little bit of a background, like if you were given a task to do at work, you'd be in a good position to start that task because you know all about your company. You know what their values are, you know what they're trying to achieve, you know where they operate. So it's all sort of just like background information. And when you formulate your answers to a question, you do that with all of that, just in part of your being, just knowing that because, because you know, because you work there. And that's what they're trying to do with the exam here. So everything in the pre-release is available to you through the pop-up windows. You're not necessarily going to have to use any of it specifically, but you ought to have like the background of the company in your mind as you approach the exam. Right, so that was our weakness, then what are we going to do about it? As you might suggest, the goods received note needs to be reconciled to the purchase order. This will prevent goods being accepted when they are not ordered. Hayley, that's absolutely fine. Yes, you can certainly mention what the when we talk about like what the implication will be. So you can use the phrase this will affect this, that, and the other. Absolutely. See if we can find another weakness, shall we? There are more than we actually need, as we've already said. We've got plenty in here. Um, there was that problem, wasn't there, about things being stored in a manual file? We could mention that one as a weakness. So purchase invoices are stored in a manual file. and updated weekly into the ledger. So if we just, I suppose, force ourselves back into our routine, it's like that's our identify, let's explain why that would be a problem. Well, you said that actually as we, we went through the question, you said there's a risk that they'll be lost. therefore not entered. And if the invoices are lost and not entered, I suppose, or let's say additional bogus invoices might be added to the pile. Two issues there. Invoices could be lost and entered, additional bogus invoices are added to the manual file. In both cases, trade payables will be misstated. This is the implication. So we'll end up with incorrect trade payables as well as incorrect purchases figure. Yes, yes, quite right. We did mention that. As I said, we don't actually have um, enough weaknesses in our list to be able to mention absolutely everything. So we've got to pick and choose a little bit. So you could, I suppose you could even combine those if you wanted here. You could say the purchase invoices are stored in the manual file. That's a problem. And also they're not checked. I'd probably, probably split those, I think. So I'd have that as a separate weakness. But they're just, we've just got to pick out a few weaknesses because there are more than we actually need here. So if that's our weakness, what are we going to do about it? I 
Well, we're saying they're stored in this manual file and updated weekly. So how are we going to fix that? Yep, update them daily. So this improvement would be update the invoices on a daily basis instead of a weekly basis. Absolutely. As they're received. So don't leave them hanging about in that manual file. And because they're done in a batch control, if you remember, let's say each invoice should get a unique sequential number. So gaps in the sequence can be identified once entered. Now, Louise, you can certainly suggest that. Remember that these exams are marked by real people. So that means that there is an only one suggestion or one answer. So as long as you come up with something relevant and if your improvement is to maybe even enter into some sort of relationship with the suppliers whereby the invoices are sort of sent through automatically to your accounting system. I mean, you can sort of do any sort of reverse invoicing if you want as a suggestion, as long as it's going to be... Um, relevant to the actual weakness that we're dealing with here, you can certainly suggest, suggest that. We can use a supplier reference, Brittany, but every supplier reference will be different. So if the reference number we used in our system was the supplier's reference, and I'm not saying that won't be included, I'm just saying I want my own reference as well. Because if I use a supplier reference and I have, let's say, 100 different suppliers, there's no way to see if an invoice is missing. If I give each invoice a unique number, let's just say one through to 50, I can immediately see from that list that number 47 isn't there. Where's number 47? Why is it not there? Why is it missing? So the point of having our own unique number in system is to be able to identify any gaps in the sequence, which is why the sequential reference number is really important. So we would record the supplier's reference as well as we input the invoice, but I have my own unique reference as well. And the invoices should be referenced to the good receives notes as well. Yes, absolutely. We've got to make sure that the invoices are referenced to the purchase order and the purchase order is perhaps referenced to the good receive note. You can even reference the invoice to the good receive note. Everything should be linked to everything else. Yes. Okay. Um, last one then, weakness number five. Have we got another one? A big one I think I remember from the end, and we have got these extra ones that we talked about as we reviewed the information, but an extra one at the end there, purchase invoices are um, reviewed and authorised and the payment is made 70 days later. No problem, it's better to ask if you're not clear, Brittany. So I think there's another big weakness I might include here. So maybe start with a, a good thing. So although the invoice is actually authorised before payment, payments are only made 70 days later. 70 days after input into the computer, if I remember correctly. So that's my weakness. Why is it a risk? Remember for each one, you identify and then you explain. So the risk is, I think there's a couple of risks. I think that we are potentially losing out on settlement discounts. You know how some suppliers will offer a discount if you pay early? So losing out on the possibility of early settlement discounts. And 
potentially by ignoring supplier terms. We might alienate our suppliers. I might not want to deal with this anymore. You might use the phrase, you might lose some goodwill from the suppliers. I mean, if the payment terms are 70, then there isn't a problem. But the risk that we're seeing here, I, I doubt that every supplier has payment terms of 70 days. It's not a very common payment term in the first instance, and it would be unusual for everybody to have the same terms. So we're thinking that it's just convenient for whatever reason for Horizon to pay after 70 days. It's not really good enough. Yeah, so they might, this, well, this person never pays on time, so we're not gonna send them our best products, certainly. Oh, common payment terms, some people ask for, I suppose, cash on delivery. Um, others are going to ask for payment within 14 days or 30 days or something like that. So if the payment terms are 70, then there's no problem, but I think it's perhaps unlikely. Yeah, bad reputation, so we lo lose goodwill. And then, of course, if we then want to get new suppliers, we talked about updating our... Talked about updating our terms with the suppliers. Um, and that would mean that when we update our supplier list, then we might find people don't want to supply to us because we've got a bad reputation now. Yeah, absolutely, Hayley, spot on. So let's then go from the weakness to the recommendation or the improvement. Would we su suggest maybe that we pay them in accordance with their agreed payment terms? So I'd say let's pay the suppliers according to the agreed terms. Because when we take on a supplier, we know what their terms of payment are. If we don't like them, go to another supplier. Yeah, that's another good suggestion. When you actually review your supplier list, you can review the terms of payment with them perhaps. If you're not happy with the terms, review the terms of payment with the supplier. but then stick to what you've agreed. And consider paying early because of the settlement discounts. So if some suppliers are offering early settlement discounts, work out if you actually want to take advantage of those. Yes, pay early to negotiate the chances of getting bigger discounts. If they see you as a good customer that does pay on time or pays early, yeah, then there's a chance that you might get discounts in future. Yes, it could be somebody in the accounts team. I mean, maybe that is the issue if there is a cash flow problem that we think, well, the longer we take to pay, the better our working capital cycle is, but it just is likely to upset our suppliers. And it's not really a great way to do business if we're trying to be sustainable and an ethical organization, good to staff, good to work for, and then we blow the reputation by not paying people on time, it seems a bit of a shame. Yes, and it should be based on the invoice date, not the date it's added to the system. I agree. Yes, we need to pay according to their agreed terms. So we need to make sure that we pay them at the right time. Okay. So that was that then. So that was an example of a task number six. If you are a first intuition student, you will have access to more mocks. So that was taken from our mock number two. You've also got mock number one to work through, as well as mocks three and four on our learning portal. So for anybody who isn't an FI student, I think I might have mentioned before that we do have a mock package if anybody is interested only 15 pounds and um, it's an online thing so if you order it today it arrives today so it's not like you're waiting for anything to turn up in the post so yeah you might certainly consider that if you need a bit of extra mock practice let me just check what else popped up in the chat box abigail i think when i'm reading the paragraphs and i'm trying to identify the weaknesses you can either choose the ones that you think are like the biggest ones that jump out of the page, like the biggest ones in terms of the impact for the company, or the ones that you think that you can explain the best. 
I generally think there will be some that are bigger than others. So go with the ones that maybe that you notice first that you think, yeah, actually, that's a really obvious one. I've got a lot I can say about that. In terms of how you list them number one to five, you don't have to start with the one that you think is the most important and go to the least important. You can just do them in the order that they actually came up in the scenario. And I think that's what the mark would be, what, what the mark would be expecting, that you'd actually start with the first weakness you identified and went on to the last one. There's no extra marks for doing them in any particular order. And Jonathan, task six is 15 marks. Oh, OK, that one's been answered. Yeah. Uh, we haven't got a link to the answers in Mach 1 because we were using Mach 2 here. So um, Mach 1 is certainly in your folder. If you've got the FI folder, definitely in there. Yes, Stalia, certainly. There should be sufficient weaknesses in the actual, what we call the impact information, because this was particularly about the purchaser system. But if you can find a weakness in the pre-release information that you think is relevant to the question, you can certainly use that. Yes, and I'll find you the link for the past recordings. There you go. So definitely worth checking those out. Oh, lovely. Lovely. OK, so I will then um, sign off there and say good luck to everybody. Hope it goes really well. If you do have a tutor, be it an FI one or another one, please keep in touch with them. Ask them questions. Make sure that they're marking your work and giving you some feedback. Give it your best shot. Good luck, everybody. Wishing you all the very best. Yeah, last exam. Oh, my goodness, what a feeling that is, isn't it? <laughs> Incredible. Well, we don't have another session next week, Irene, because um, the exam window is next week. So we're assuming that you're actually going to be sitting this exam next week. So we're not going to have a session next week. We will pick the sessions up again before the next window. The solutions for Mach 1 are in our course materials, but we don't actually have um, Mach 1 in our revision questions, so we don't have the solutions to mock one there either. Uh, we don't have a task three video either. Uh, we only, well, we, I say that, we do have a task three video, but not for this pre-release. So if you'd like to watch a task three video, we will have some. If you go to these past session links, there will be an example of a task three. It will just be on a different pre-release. We only have three sessions, so we had to pick what we perceived to be the most difficult questions. So we did that and we chose tasks two, four and six this time. So I wish you all the very, very best. Oh goodness, I, in terms of the likelihood, I have no idea what's likely to come up. It could certainly be a SWOT, it could be a cost benefit analysis. Make sure you just practice questions on everything and then you're going to be as prepared as you can possibly be. So Brittany, yes, could definitely be. Make sure that you just have practice of everything you can. Okay, thank you all for joining. I'm going to bring the session to an end here.